Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is Thursday, June 3rd, 2021. It is 1131 a.m. here in San Diego, California. And I have the pleasure of speaking with ranked lightweight in the UFC, Mr. Drew Dober. Thank you so much for the time. Of course. I love doing this kind of stuff. Yeah, this should be a, a lot, a lot of fun. So I know these these coming days can be a little brutal, but is there something you've kind of been able to do over the years so you can master, you know, the, the week or two weeks leading up to, uh, you know, a big fight week? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, as far as, uh, you know, controlling uh, the anxieties, it's uh, just practicing mindfulness. You know, today's just Thursday morning uh, and uh, just got to accomplish Thursday morning then Thursday evening. And then, you know, I try to avoid thinking about too far ahead and uh, man, but like one week out, two weeks out, it's, it's the most entertaining because, you know, the training and the work's kind of winding down. And then I get the opportunity to kind of talk to the fans, talk to the to people, actually fly into the destination city, be surrounded by the environment. And uh, that's when you feel the energy and the excitement. And so it's, it's, it's getting exciting. You're talking about the the mindfulness thing, and it kind of sounds like almost like being present, right? Like don't get too ahead, don't fall back too much. You know, you're trying to stay focused on Thursday midday and staying present. Are you seeing like a sports psychologist? Um, I have uh, seen uh, two actually, and uh, I work with a, a local uh, guy named uh, Joey, but he's giving me all the tools I need to kind of constantly practice. Uh, mindfulness and it's one of those things like <laughs> once you have it it doesn't mean you always have it and so you know I got to constantly keep on practicing it and uh, this uh, this week or this week and a half is when I usually really focus on it because it does get hard this uh, this job but uh, man if you uh, try to <laughs> think about everything it gets overwhelming so you try to just think about the here and now I in these like podcasts and interviews one thing I really try and do is like I try and represent the common person, right? Like I'm your average Joe. I, I love fight nights on Saturday or whatever, but like, I mean, I've never stepped in a fucking cage before. So I, I really try and like admit that early on. I try and not really critique or criticize anyone because I've never been punched in the face six times in a row. Like I've been punched in the face once, but you know, not six times in a row. And then they jump on top of me and then they hit me with an elbow. Um, but you know, like a lot of us at home, maybe we dabble in like boxing. We go to the boxing gym three times a week, or maybe, you know, you go to kickboxing class, whatever it might be. We dabble in it. We have a little bit of fun. And I think one thing that becomes apparent is like, you know, your second week, you learn something at jujitsu class does not mean two weeks later, you're going to be able to do it over again or do it as well. You know, it's so easy to forget those things and stay on top of it. it. You really do have to sharpen the tools every single day. Has that ever become not monotonous, but how do you kind of like remain focused on a lot of those little things that you maybe learned in the past? Man, uh, as long as I've been in this career, I find out that the more you learn, the more you forget. And so it's just that uh, the constant excitement to uh, learn things or relearn things or to practice things. Um, I feel like a lot of guys uh, start thinking more about the outcome and the success, the finish line, the end story and all that stuff. And, uh, man, it, it's a rat race. No matter what field you're doing, whatever hobby job you're doing, right, there really is no end. It's just constant learning, improving. So you got to find enjoyment in that journey, uh, in, in the practice, in, in the, the daily activities. And so, yeah, whether I'm learning new things or relearning things or repracticing things, you know, you got to find enjoyment in that. What What is something you think, like, you know, it, I'm, I, I love gym culture. I love team camaraderie. I love like, you know, maybe you look at a teammate and you say, oh, I want to do it like them. Or, you know, maybe they look at you and they want to do something the way you do it. What is something you think you do above average in comparison to other people? So it could be technical, but it also could be a mindset thing. What's something like, not necessarily you take pride in, but you do find yourself like, you know, Everyone else kind of struggles with this, but I, I seem to be all right at it. Is there anything that kind of stands out to you when you when you think about like practices or going to the gym all the time? For me, I think it's just happiness. 
you know, for me, for what I've learned is, uh, you know, the more entertainment I, I show, the more fun I'm having, the more damage I cause and the more successful I am. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, technique stays the same, uh, whether you're like lifting or running or, or you're doing boxing, but the more entertainment, the more passion you have uh, for the, the technique, the better it comes out. And so I think uh, just my smile is my best attribute as a fighter. Sure. So this is actually a good little segue because this will be the first fight you've had with fans, right? Like in Arizona. And you've talked about, I know you've said this before, like you're a performer, right? You're there to, to put on a show. You don't necessarily look at like um, opponents as like stepping stones or ladders to the top. You just view each individual night as a performance. Does that excite you then just more than even the average Joe that you're going to be performing again with an audience, right? Like if this was theater, you now have an audience in front of you. Does do you think it excites you more than maybe excites even other people? Uh, the simple answer is yes, of course. But uh, man, like I was, I was trying to deny, you know, uh, the, the level of excitement, uh, you know, the last year because there's like empty auditoriums, and I was like, yeah, you know, it makes no difference. You close the cage door, we're still performing. I know there's cameras there. I know people are watching. It's like still feels the same. But uh, now once they announced that there was going to be audience members, I was like, just had that buzz, you know, the, the energy in my heart, like it just got me excited. And then I went back and uh, rewatched some of my old fights uh, just, you know, for sheer like improvement. And then I started noticing that, yeah, my energy is drawn from the crowd and uh, man, it just, the, the crowd, the yells, the, the, the cheers, the boos, it just hits differently than an empty auditorium. And so, yeah. Uh, excitement is, uh, you know, putting it lightly. Well, in, uh, funny enough, and I know you get Justin Gagey questions a lot, but like that almost does feel like a similarity kind of like between you two is like, he's kind of there to put on a show, right? Like when he goes and, um, I know like Corey's gone through a little bit of a transition where he, he kind of talked about like, oh, he used to like putting on, now he's a little more like focus on being like a stone cold killer, but it kind of does seem to be like a common denominator amongst like your teammates at elevation. Is that just by coincidence or is that something almost being encouraged by coaches? You know, I think uh, just the, the enjoyment and then the fans kind of puts you in the zone and in that zone, you can perform the best. Uh, some people have different ways of using it, like with Corey or Curtis. But uh, coincidentally, I think Justin Gaethje and I just so happen to have the same mindset on the same team in the same like mat. And uh, man, I, I just I love bouncing not only ideas but technique and skills and all that stuff off Justin Gaethje. And uh, yeah, it's just sheer coincidence that uh, just the two most entertaining men in the lightweight division are in the same camp. It's and again, like I, I wasn't sure if it was coincidence. I, I just like I didn't know if like you two were being coached to be performers or what it was. So I, I had to ask. Um, behind you, is that a Reebok or is that a Venom? Uh, Drew Dover warm so jacket. Currently the Reebok because yeah. I have yet to get my new Venom one. But uh, really? yeah, we just wearing this one behind me until we upgrade to the Venom. How often? Like when was the last time you wore that? I mean, as of right now, like recently, <laughs> just anytime it's like raining or cold out, like these are the jackets I just like throw on. Or like, I know it's kind of uh, conceited to wear your own name on your jacket, but uh, yeah, you know, you get it for free, might as well wear it. Yeah, no, 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 fuck that. When, when you fight in the UFC, you can kind of do whatever you want. No one's going to tell you, by the way, that you're not allowed to, you know, that's kind of the luxury of being a fighter. So like, obviously, you know, these few days, weight cut, whatever, it sucks. But you've had enough experience now. Like, this isn't your first rodeo by any means. And you're always in phenomenal shape, right? Like, aesthetically, it's fucking ridiculous how <laughs> yoked you always look. So, you know, us at home, we're, we're eating potato chips. We're having a beer while we're watching the fights, whatever it might be. Some of us might be a few beers. Some of us, it might be a whole pizza. I'm probably the latter. But what is something like over time that you've realized like health rule, diet, dieting rule that you've kind of like, you know, I think this really works for me. Like it may be not for other people, but 
this is something that I, I've adapted over time and adopted over time and and it's kind of worked for me. Is there a, a single dietary like piece of advice you can give, you know, the average Joe? I mean, what's really worked for me is being paid to get in shape. So that's Fuck. that's a different kind of a motivation than most people have. Um, uh, but no seriousness. Um, I think uh, not only like, like we just talked about mindfulness, but also just being mindful of like your exercise and diet. You know, it's a uh, don't feel guilty for having the occasional cheeseburger or drinking the beer. I mean, I love myself some wine. And uh, so like when I'm done with fight, I'll send in bottles myself. Um, but just what kind, also, what kind? Uh, all kind. I wish I was like snobby and like picky, but really like, I really enjoy it. If it's white, it's Riesling or uh, I mean, Chardonnay. Yeah. If it's red, it's uh, Cab or Merlot. But I mean, there's blends I'm really digging. I just bought two bottles of, it's called the prisoner. So yeah, it's a red blend. So yeah, I'm not picky at all as long as it's fine. But uh, but back to the you know diet and exercise, it's just being mindful of your exercise, being mindful of your diet, and uh, just trying to work that 80 20 80 percent of the time. You know you're you're being diligent, disciplined, and then 20 percent of the time, you know, just enjoy yourself. You know, life's but like <laughs> peaks and valleys, and so even with me. You know, I'm at my leanest, but then like after this, then I'll get my heaviest. And it's like that constant roller coaster. And, and that's why you want to like dismiss the outcome mindset where it's like, well, this is it. This is the finish line because life always changes. So you just got to enjoy the process. And so I'm enjoying getting skinny. I'm going to have some pictures taken while I'm at my leanest, but I'm also going to enjoy getting fat after the fight too. Um, When you say like getting fat quote unquote what like what's a number you hit and then you're like all right i got i gotta stop <laughs> <laughs> uh well i mean usually at that time i don't try to i avoid the scale completely sure. <laughs> um, but uh the last time i was in an all-inclusive cancun trip so like five days of like all you can eat and drink i came back about 190 <laughs> so, oh yeah so i've seen about 195 uh I have not seen 200 yet, but that's maybe because I haven't stepped on the scale. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, my, my weight fluctuates a ton. So I, I've come to term this year that I can't wear the same size clothes all year round. So I have my pre-fight, my post-fight outfits. That, uh, wow. I mean, like, generally it feels like, you know, guys in incredible shape, they can go up and down rather easily, right? Like you can, you can turn it on real quick or – you know, if you turn it off, it can kind of go the other way. Uh, question for you here. Like, obviously, you've had some very exciting fights in your career. If you could only pick one fight for someone who's never seen Drew Dober fight before, which fight are you having them watch? Oh, my uh, my fight with Frank Camacho was incredible. You know, we exchanged like 300 significant blows in that fight. We got fight of the night. And, uh, man, and, and then the sheer respect, the attitude, and the energy – like, I, I really enjoy Frank Camacho, and I'm excited to be on the same card as him this time around. But, uh, yeah, if you if you want to see the, the true essence of Drew Dober, I mean, that's the fight to watch. So, you know, when when the average Joe, I'm, I'm representing them, when we watch you fight, like, you know, staying in Southpaw, a lot of times the straight left is a, a, is a punch that, like, does a lot of damage for you. But we often will miss, like, how you get there and how you do it. So, like, looking at the Berkman – you know, finish or the Berkman KO. It's beautiful, but I don't like necessarily know what I'm looking at when I'm watching it. So what made, you know, the Berkman finish, what made that so spectacular? What was a small detail that you think most common folk at home maybe missed that really set up like a blow like that? Um, it's um, movement and uh, knowledge of range. So like like they think about like dancing right you don't want to step on your partner's toes right so it's the the the, the rhythm the movement knowing like the twirls and the you know the distance and of course the the range just how close or far away you are from your opponent right because you want to hit that sweet spot right so you don't want to be too far away but you also don't want to be too close and so and it's just things are constantly moving if you want to stay moving with that knowledge of range okay interesting is that a is that a like elevation like mantra or motto or do you think like you're just kind of speaking in general i mean in general like boxers do it all the time but 
uh, me personally, man, I, I had problems with it uh, earlier in my career. I started off in Muay Thai. In Muay Thai, you just draw a line and you step on it and nobody moves, right? You beat each other up. But uh, I was struggling in mixed martial arts or in the UFC because guys were just moving around, like Dominic Cruz. Like, those guys are incredible. Mm-hmm. So I got with my specific striking coach, uh, and uh, I told him I wanted to learn how to perform Muay Thai in motion. And I remember he reminds me too, way too often that I walked in going, well, I don't move like that. And so now, like five years later, I'm, I'm moving extremely well. And so, uh, yeah, it wasn't a thing I started off doing, but uh, it's, it's been the most beneficial to my knockouts of the UFC. So, and this is a question I kind of have, and this doesn't necessarily just apply to like mixed martial arts. It probably applies to a lot of things, but like when you're developing your craft, you're naturally good at some things, right? Like you can kind of walk in and, and some things are going to be easier for you. Some things will be a little bit harder. How do you balance saying like, I'm a Muay Thai guy, right? This is what I do. This is what I practice for a long time. I'm going to stick with what I know works while also like balancing like, oh, I got to sharpen my other tools. I got to evolve my game a little bit. It feels like that could be a tricky kind of balance at times do you remember like a, uh, a moment where you're like, okay, things might have to change? Or do you remember a moment where you're like, no, I know that this is my game. I know this is what will work. I'm going to stick with it and, and it will work out in the end. I think it's uh, uh, on, season, on season or off season uh, in, in my perspective. You know, when I'm my off season, you know, I try to improve on uh, what I'm bad at, you know, and I'll watch former fights of mine. I'm like, yeah, I need to work on that. I need to do this. And so, because when you're working on something you're not good at, you're going to constantly fail. And so I do it in the off season because off season is just constant fail. Like I just get beat up all the time. Right. And then you get on season as in like you get a fight scheduled and then you start leaning into the area of like what you're good at. Right. And so then that builds that confidence. Right. So in the off season, you improve on kind of like your backups, which you're not good at. And then you're in season preparing for a fight. You like practice what you're good at, knowing full well that you have the the, you know, the backups to fall back on. So, man, it's just a constant fluctuation, you know. So, you know, after my last loss uh, against Islam, I looked at it like this is what I need to work on. And so, man, I was grappling heavy. And then I got the fight offer with Brad Riddell, who's the striker. And so, yeah, of oh, course. Well, now I'm confident in my defense. I can take the, the fight to the ground. I can even like move around on the ground if I want to. But now I get to have fun and enjoy the Muay Thai again. Which, and I, I thought the like the matchmaking of that was really fun, right? Like you, you obviously, oh, which by the way, congrats on the new contract. Forgot to mention it. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Pretty badass. Um, matchmaking on this fight's really, really great. Like just as a fight fan, this is it's it's got to be fireworks like there's just no other way around it this is going to be a a doozy here um so you you sign the contract sick six six fight contract you know we often hear guys like maybe having disagreements with the ufc or not even just the ufc like promote their promotion in general right like oh you know it didn't work out we we didn't see eye to eye on things why do you think why do you think you're such a good like employee i know that's not the right phrase or term but like why do you think you're such a good matchup or partnership with the ufc like to earn this contract so many guys you know you see them struggle to get the right deal the right contract oh it's not working out like what do you think is missed by a lot of fighters or by promotions when it comes like that partnership um i think it's just the mentality that gaichi and donald cerrone carry it's the anywhere, anytime, you know, but uh, it, it's just not like reckless. It's just just sheer enjoyment. And uh, I, I think it's a, a contagious. I think people really enjoy watching, you know, these types of fighters enjoy themselves, you know, and anytime you, you throw out negative energy, uh, you know, we're talking about how you're being mistreated and you're not getting this and that, like people kind of like scorn at that, like they're not interested, right? And so when you get guys like uh, Cowboy Cerrone or Justin Gaethje who are like, win or lose, we're still watching them fight because they carry that positive excitement and, like, it's contagious. And, like, you know, anytime Cerrone fights, I could care less how many losses he has. Like, I'm still watching and I'm so excited for it. And, you know, I think that's the same kind of energy I carry. And, uh, you know, and like I said, I could care less about outcomes. You know, I just care about the specific performances and the individual fights. I talked about this with uh, Randy Costa because we were talking about like, dude, 
you can not win the title and still be a Hall of Famer, like, in the UFC. Like, people just do not care that, that much, like, mm-hmm. about the quote-unquote gold or whatever. Like, I'm not saying it's not important. Like, it's it's a brilliant, incredible, incredible accomplishment. But I think a lot of times people might miss the mark on, like, what it is to be a artist, right? If you're an artist, a mixed martial artist, you're performing. And you know, you, the Cowboys and the, the Gaethje's of the world, like they go out and they just put on a show. It's an absolute blast to watch. Um, okay, so no negative energy, right? We're, we're not going to do it. But when you came to the UFC, I wanted to ask about this time because, you know, when you're, when you're told over and over, you're such a positive guy, man. You smile all the time. Looks like you really enjoy it. You know, people say like, oh man, it, it's got to be great being a podcast or getting to interview all these great guys. Yes, it is. But when you do feel down, then you sometimes like feel obligated almost to like be that instead of saying like, no, I, I'm honestly like, I'm a little bummed right now, whatever it might be. You know, those first two fights in the UFC didn't go your way. And so I wonder like when you look back on that time, did you remain 100% positive the same way you are right now? Or did you kind of have a realization like, no, I'm a little bummed about the way it's gone and I got to change some, whatever it might be. What do you remember about that time before things kind of really took off? I mean, this is a long answer. It depends on you know, how much time you have. But uh, yeah. Sorry, right. I apologize. I apologize. Oh, I'm open to talk about all of it. But um, so yeah, entering the UFC, I, I, I went 0-2. And, uh, you know, the first fight, uh, it, it, was, it was a struggle. I mean, I, I got... I was sitting in a diner, you know, just eating my face off post fight. And they're like, Hey, can you fight in the UFC up a weight class in two weeks? And, uh, man, I had to drop my fork, hit a treadmill and, uh, man, it, it was just tough. And so I went out there and gave my best and, uh, you know, I didn't get the decision to win. Right. And so like giving your best, no matter the outcome, giving your best is th- the only thing you can do. And so, you know, if you give 100% to something and it doesn't go your way, then it doesn't hurt as bad, right? So, but, um, you know, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result is uh, is insanity. So after that loss, I made some changes, moved out to Colorado, started training with Team Elevation, and then I suffered my second loss in the UFC. I gave it 100%, uh, you know, when you do that, it doesn't hurt as bad. But again, I have to make some changes. And so that's when I hired uh, my striking coach. We made some technical adjustments and, and this and that. And then I got my uh, fight off with Jimmy Barner, which was nuts. But, uh, you know, I put on fantastic, uh, you know, entertaining fights and I wasn't discouraged. I take opportunities and, uh, you know, that's what I carry. And so there was a moment going into that fight. Uh, I was in the locker room and I was thinking to myself, like, man, if I lose this fight, that's three in a row. And I'm cut from the UFC. And I was like, you know what? I can make it back if I lose this fight and I, and I have to go back to the regional promotion. I know I have the ability to get back into the UFC. So who cares? And so once I went to like the, the who cares, I'm just going to go out there and just kill it. You know, and then I got in that tunnel then my walkout music came on and I had this really like this, this sense of like, man, this is what I love doing. Like, I love being in the cage. I should stop thinking about what happens after the cage. And so I just got in there and performed. And then I got that win over Jamie Varner. And then that's kind of what hit. It's like, Oh, if I, as soon as I stop caring about like outcomes and like the bits and like what ifs and you know the scenarios, then I could just enjoy the moments and perform at my best. And uh, yeah, that's the moment. But at that that moment, it was just by accident. And so in my entire UFC career, I've been trying to do that mindset on purpose. And it's never easy, right? It's not, like I said, it's it, there's no finish line. Just like uh, my my loss with Islam Makhachev, it hurts. And then I developed a perfectionist mindset. I don't want to lose again. So I got, I got, I had a little chip on my shoulder going into the gym and uh, man, it started feeling like a job. I have to, I need to, and this must be and all this stuff. And like, it's again, negative energy. And when you feel so constricted and stressed and anxiety, then you just can't perform. So just recently, like, you know, the beginning of this camp, I had to fix that, uh, that perfectionist mindset and get back to just having fun again. So uh, confidence does not rely on accomplishment, right? You can have confidence and have zero accomplishment. So it's all just knowing what you're capable of and having fun in the journey. And uh, that, that's so awesome. It's a constant practice. And, you know, anybody that's watching, you know, whether you're getting punched in the face or not, anything that you're doing, you just, you just constantly practice positive energy, happiness, 
and excitement. And then uh, sometimes it, it goes away. Like, you know, you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm not feeling that well. And you just kind of practice like either just being in that moment. It's like, hey, today's just that day. Or you just change your mindset about it. It's like, all right, well, I don't feel good about this, but I do feel great about this. And you just you just adjust and play, and it's just constant practice. Well, you make it you make it sound easy. I know that it isn't at all <laughs> by any means, but really appreciate you sharing that. I know I'm sure like you've gotten that question before, or whatever. But you know, I just know like as I try and smile a lot too. I try and be a really positive guy. I just know that sometimes like when I do feel down, I feel like an obligation or whatever you know, to still be the smiley guy, but it can be difficult almost to admit like, man, like two losses, this kind of fucking sucks. Like, you know, to have that moment. So I appreciate you sharing that, Drew. No, but that, that, that's it. What, what you just, just did right there, that's exactly what people should be doing, which is just laughing it off. Like, damn, two losses, that sucks, right? But like, yeah. it's like, just being able to talk about it and laugh at it, you know? If I slip and fall up some stairs and people laugh, I want to laugh with them, like, Man, we all fail. And so we got to like, just like, all right, well, we fail. It happens, but you got to laugh it off. That's awesome. So, Drew, that's that's more than enough time. Thank you, dude. I, I really, really appreciated this conversation. Um, I had a blast. I enjoyed every second of it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the time. I, I know these minutes are valuable, and, and I know these weeks can be stressful, but really just appreciate all this. Best of luck, best of energy, good vibes, sending them all your way. Really, really looking forward to watching you perform next week. Thank you so much. And uh, this is why I do this. I love talking with you guys.